Hey, Composing Gloves here, and today we're going to be talking about Isotope Trash 2, the filter module. Now, I have a track here. I'm going to play it for you. In this in this little track, I have only done things with Trash 2. So, all the mixing and stuff like that, that's all been done with Trash 2. Now, let me play it for you real quick. So you see we get jamming a little bit, but it also has huge mixing capabilities. Now we've covered the spectrogram already, so let's go into these filters. Let's talk about what these filters do. Essentially, it's a fully parametric EQ that also gives you a number of filter options. Most most of them do, uh, but this one gives you quite a, quite a number of them, like much more than most plugins will. So it's kind of a cool deal. So we're going to take a look at that. Now, I'm also using to get this thing to sound as clean as it does the dynamics module quite a bit in combination with side chaining. That will be another video for another day, maybe even a different track. But what we're going to look at right now is this module. So we have this and we have this filter module. And let's, um, let's go ahead and take a look at this first one here. So here we have this first one. And if you're unfamiliar with filters versus peak filters. So let's, let's talk about that. So let's open up a parametric EQ2 to show you the difference. Actually, I can show you the difference in here. So you see that this, this right here, this black line represents that filters curve, the contour of that filter. Or not, I'm not sure contour is the right word, but you know, the, the shape of that filter. For, and this is a peaking filter, obviously. Versus, so that's what the black line represents. This red line represents the actual line, the actual resonance, the, the thing that's getting through. For example, if we were to move this over let me, uh, yep, it is detached. Whoa, I don't want to do that. Okay, so we'll come, come over here. As you see, as I move it across, the red line changes shape. This is because it's combining with the various black lines from the different filters and of the way they're combining. So it creates a new shape. So the red line is the actual the actual thing that's getting through on your system. So that's, that's all you need to really understand there is what these two lines represent. So you see, if you click on one, it'll also bring it into focus down here. So you see, we have the ability to select the frequency it's at, so we can like change the frequency. We can change the amount of cut or boost in this particular one, because it's a high pass filter, I do not have that option. If I put my focus on five, you see I can cut or boost accordingly. If I alt click, it'll reset it to its default value. And then I have control over Q, which is essentially, you can look at it as your resonance, but it also can't be looked at as resonance really. Because you can see right here a wide or narrow Q or a small Q and a big Q, not that I said that backwards, uh, will not change anything. Now, if you're not familiar with Q, Q, uh, there's like, an, I believe it's center frequency divided by bandwidth. I forgot the exact formula. There's a formula that gets you Q. All you need to really understand about Q is that uh, the higher the number in Q, the more narrow the band. The lower the number, the wider the band. That's that's it. So if you're moving something around, it essentially will allow you to control your resonance, sort of, because it, it can get a little complicated if you get into algorithms that change depending on the signal and what's hitting that signal at that moment. You can get you can get really pretty uh, crazy filters, but basically, you most things will respond to the resonance you put via Q. Now. Let's go ahead and talk about the actual filters themselves. So you see here, I've got some automation going on and you notice that it's actually really low. Why is it so low? Well, it's super low because of the way this thing interprets the automation. So actually it's very, it takes much longer. It, it makes like 90% of the movement happens in this amount of space. So if you're going to automate anything in here, that's moving across the spectrum, you're going to need to automate it. You can either set the min and max value to something different. If you can do that in your DAW or, and you also have uh, those controls right here. If you, if you want to do that, so you could set it so that this value is now the full value, or you could just do what I do and just automate it really small amounts. Just zoom it up. We need to get to it. So now we can, you know, mess with it here and put it back. So that's what I did there. Now this is a high pass and you notice that down here we also have the these are called the filter nodes and on each one we have our we can in individually affect them without having to like put them in without having to select them here. And so we go oh yeah filter node 
This is one, two, three, four, five, six, and you can select them like so. Now, you can also do something else that's pretty cool. If you're playing your sound, you can actually alt click and this will pop up. If you're playing it, that is what filter node is hearing. I mean, filter four, filter node. That's filter uh, node five. So that's what it's hearing. That's what it's generally, that's where it's band lies. Now, that what it's actually filtering and what that is are two separate things though. So that, that just like gives you a little glimpse into that area of the spectrum. It's not like the actual filter shape. If you go into spectrum options or not spectrum options, go to modules and go to filter and you see we can actually change the Q of that. So a very large Q will give you a very broad band. I mean a very narrow band, a very, very small band like we just saw versus this. So I keep mine around like five or six. I had it on seven earlier. The reason is I want to see what it's around there. I don't want to see like the whole spectrum. It wouldn't be very useful for me. But I don't want something that's so narrow that it's like going to be an ear piercing single frequency going right into my ear. I don't want that either. So I've set it to five. It's about that big. So, like, oh, that's what's there. And some, oh, uh, now let's talk about the difference between the peaking again and the. The filter. A filter will filter out frequencies. A peaking filter will, but it doesn't do it to the same extent that like a, a high pass or a low pass filter will. You see we have this very steep, not well in this case it's not super steep, but we have this this curve that goes down and it reduces, it's visually showing us that it's reducing volume. Now visually and what's actually happening are two separate things. You see a filter, it's made to remove the frequencies past there, where the peakings are made to affect only the frequencies that, you know, it has jurisdiction over. You put a center frequency and then it will reduce the frequencies around that center frequency. If we click on it, see, here's the center. And then according to our Q setting, we can change what frequencies it really can affect. And it will affect the overall shape of our filter movement. I put a dip here because when the filter movement crosses this moment, it's, it's, it's got a resonance boost. You see, it's actually pushing things above zero. And as a result, these frequencies become, in this particular region, become unpleasant to listen to during that sweep. Now, if I wanted to be really cool and fancy and mix it really well, I would use a dynamic equalizer. And what that would do is it would only attenuate the frequencies once they pass a threshold right here. So that, because when the sound is playing regular, they don't go past that. So I don't want to make a permanent cut there because... If I do that, then I'm then that, that area of the spectrum is permanently affected. It doesn't respond dynamically because that part of the spectrum is important to the sound. Here, I just put a cut because I'm I'm being a little bit lazy and I don't I don't need it's not like that big of a deal to me right now. In a mix, I might go and do that if I like really wanted to. It's really just a judgment call, uh, but theoretically, it will sound cleaner. But it will also eat up more spectrum. So there's gives and takes on like pretty much. You can look at this so many different ways. But those are just some thoughts concerning a move, a cut like this. Now, I'm not going to go like into general big EQing, but when we have this going down, a filter. Th so the big thing between a filter, why, why I use a filter versus like, uh, why not just do like a bunch of cuts like this and then like automate that or whatever? Or why not just use a low shelf or whatever? Well, there's there's various issues due to the shape of the filter. So you don't want to use like a low shelf because it can only give you in this case it gives you negative 30 decibels that's the max you're going to get out of this thing you're not ever going to get below negative 30 now negative 30 is outrageously softer i think my voice just did a weird crackle thing right there but uh it's also it's still audible you'll still be able to hear that you'll still have remnants of it now in a mix it'll probably disappear and then what does it become mud it becomes mud a lot now i use it all the time though because a lot of the times when I'm doing crazy filter movements like this with like an EQ, I'm going after really bizarre timbral, timbral, timbral changes. So timbral changes, even though it's spelled with an I. So when I want things to be filtered out, though, you see that this goes boop and it just disappears. And we assume that it just keeps going on and on and on. Now, in some cases, when, when this curve on a filter is exceptionally steep, it'll actually pull back up. So if like I had a super steep filter right here, let's say that it was like going down like that, like super steep. There would actually be frequencies over here that would come back. If you go into my critical listening series, I believe there's a video on filters. And <laughs> I believe there's a video where I talk about it. I can't remember the exact video, but I even show it where there's a, a super steep filter. And you can still totally, when you put it down on the one end of the spectrum, you could see frequencies coming out that should have been filtered off. That's because in the, the on the math side of things, there are trade-offs when you want to try and create a filter that does something like this. And so... Another thing about filters uh, when you're, that will become very 
it's very important to the filter size. You see, we have all these different kinds of filters. What makes them so different? Well, these different filters have different uh, amounts. They they do different things. Like some of them, uh, the, generally the smoother or the the less extreme this curve is that the filter uh, puts in, the better it will be at attenuating frequencies that are farther away. So like this curve won't give us an issue. If we like filter out, we won't have crap popping up down here. Now, of course, there's the Fletcher-Munson curves that we need to keep in mind, too, that even if it did pop up down there, we'll be less sensitive to it anyways. The higher stuff, I personally think the higher stuff becomes a little bit more noticeable as far as being a tone. The lower stuff, you probably feel. So it's just not that it contributes to a little rumble and muddiness, I guess, in that way. But another thing is these curves, not only do they do they fail uh, sometimes at doing extreme cuts like that, but they will also. So if you ever see something that touts like, oh, 102 decibels of reduction, I'm not sure if that's divisible by six or whatever. But anyways, it, it has a, basically an incredibly large cut. You should be really suspicious of what it does to just a little bit away from the spectrum. There will be sound that pops up unless they've combined it with like another filter and didn't tell you. So if it's genuinely just that one filter, there's going to be some, some trade-offs to go with it. Another thing is the phase shift will be much more extreme. This is where coloration can come into for a large part. Analog filters, they'll introduce nonlinearities and stuff because, you know, there's going to be temperatures of the components heating up and cooling down and stuff. But here... If we've got this, there's going to be phase shifts. So th this band right here is called the transition band, the band in which it's turning our signal down. During this transition band, while it's still in the audible range, these frequencies will now these frequencies will experience a phase shift. So some of these, and this is covered in my sound and synth basics videos, so they'll phase shift over, and that will cause your entire signal to sum differently, right? So we don't want that, but that's called coloration. Sometimes it produces very desirable coloration, and if you consider the way a coloration, higher frequency coloration will sound very different than lower. So depending on where the, where the filter is, we'll give it a very unique sound, a sonic characteristic. And this isn't bad, it's just different. Now, they have developed uh, EQs in linear phase, but that's the reason why when you start making moves with EQ or even just turning EQ on, it will change the way things sound. Is this, it, it's, um, man, some signals will be phase shifted. So you just need to be aware of that. So now that we've got that going on, and we've heard, we've heard what this one sounds like, right? So we've got this thing. It sounds pretty cool. And we've talked about like, oh, the automation and stuff. And now we've talked about like, oh, okay, well, this is the the frequency that you're selecting. So you can see, you select the frequency, select the cut. Let's talk about the filters a little bit more. Now I cover this in basic filter shapes. Uh, that's also in the sound and synth basics. But you see here we have clean, reson resonant, retro, saturated, screaming, synth, and vowel. So vowel is made to, well, let's start at the top. So remember all that crap I just said about phase shifts and coloration and things? Clean is supposed to do ideally nothing. I'm not sure if they're linear phase or not, but they're supposed to affect your signal without any coloration or as little as possible and theoretically without any. And so it's, it's supposed to be clean. It's just as its name implies. Resonance, obviously, you're going to get some resonance boosts around the cutoff frequency. If you're unfamiliar with resonance, resonance is just an unusual boost in volume. If it's narrow, uh, narrow band is boosted, it's going to sound very noticeable because just stuff doesn't sound that way in nature. Uh, in fact, what more often happens is we will get cuts. We'll get some sort of comb filtering. Now, you could, you, you'll experience like standing waves and stuff that will be unusual boost in tone, but they tend to bring up other tones with them. And so they tend to happen. It makes more sense to broadly increase something than it does to narrowly increase something. So just, just because that's just the way we're used to things. We've been trained to do that. If you go into like a cave or something, you may find some very odd resonant frequencies though. And that contributes to the sonic characteristics of that space. Now... So that's clean. Resonance, of course, will give you that resonance. And so we have high pass, band pass, and low pass. You'll notice that your Q settings and your resonance settings, see, see here we're given resonance. So instead of affecting the Q, we can affect the resonance, which is, which is different because it follows the cutoff filter. So you can change how resonant a thing is. Okay, uh, we have retro, and so they, they just sound different. Saturated, now, I have some theories about how these things work. They don't go in depth in the manual, and I was kind of hoping they would shed a little bit more light on some of how, why these things are special or different. Um, but maybe they just thought that it wasn't as important or not. It'd be really cool to have some like more in-detail things. I'm interested in it, at least. But saturated, I suspect some sort of a saturation is actually used. So like 
instead of there's like distortion types and saturation is sort of is a variation on distortion type so it's like light distortion sort of and it's not always linear so it'd be kind of curious to see you know i believe most of these are, are linear processes but i don't know for sure uh screaming we have the peak eq and low pass now you can imagine this probably will emphasize some unusual boosts and frequencies some unusual phase shifts perhaps that also combine with resonance we have synth and so these are all just trying to emulate different types of filters if you really want to learn what they sound like let's go ahead and just try a bunch out like so let's try out the clean high pass versus the uh, resonance high pass so here's here's the clean let's go uh let me set this to peak so it's not doing anything let's go filter six let's go to clean high pass you see, it looks very different, too. So, okay, there's a clean. Let's go do something like a... These are all low pass. Saturated high pass. And so you'll go through and you'll pick one that you like. I settled on the resonance one because I wanted, you see, the, the cutoff changes a little bit. Now, this line, too, another thing about trusting these lines in any sort of a graphical dis a graphic display, just be very skeptical, okay? What what this line looks like and what it actually does could be very, could be, they're going to be similar. They're going to, it's, it's showing you a trend, but it's not showing you, like, exactly what's going on. It's close enough to get you to, so you use your ears is all I'm saying. Just use your ears because sometimes... What it looks like it's doing is kind of way different than what it's actually doing. Another thing that might be affecting you is your space. Well, it's totally affecting you. Is the space you're in using headphones, using monitors. So just be careful about that stuff too. So I settled on this one. I like this one the most. So anyways, yeah, so that's resonance versus Q, um, which is sort of like resonance, but not really. And it doesn't have to be boosted at all. So uh, now you... You can actually take resonance down to zero. You notice that the filter shape itself, though, has it in there. So it's kind of a curious thing. You can look in here and check those sorts of things out. I'll leave it at that. Now, you have one other option in here, or not one other option. You have some else. Oh, by the way, if you want to know, you can turn on and off nodes by clicking these. I'm not sure if I said that. I hope I did. Next up, we have modulation. So in this modulation tab, you can actually control various things. And sometimes you can't control them, uh, but you can control various things with these with this modulation so you can have something else control the way something in this tab behaves so you can have it turn on and off dynamically you can use an envelope or you could use an lfo and you'll notice here that that well, this is off so it doesn't do anything here we have an, um, an envelope and you see that these tabs show up and you see this three tab shows up this is the this one represents where it's going to move to. So you could say, oh, I want it to do something like that. I want three to move around like that. And do you want it to be based on an envelope, meaning done over time? And let me open up an example of an envelope. A three, three times OSC. So I'm just going to type it in. Three, there it is. Bang. Okay, so we have a really simple. So we have an envelope. So now the thing about this is, it can use an envelope that triggers based on a threshold. So you see there's a threshold, meaning that every time audio passes this threshold, this envelope will be triggered. And then the attack is how quickly this happens, and then the release is obviously how fast it lets go. I believe the sustain is derived from how long it's over the threshold. So I believe that's how it works. And so if we, uh, if we turn it up, let's, uh, let's just mess around with it. And so what will happen is this... this uh, this filter right here is going to move from here to here. And that's pretty much what's going to happen. So if we move our attack to be really quick, let's move it kind of slow. Do a slower attack, like 41. And we'll set it down to like negative 23 and hit play. So you can see it's moving that way. Now let's go to um, let's go to this spot where that, that movement has happened. Let's just turn off drums so you can see here the bass going back and forth now we can see visually what's going on here so if we put it down below there's our our purple is our signal so if we put it up above that it would it just it'll never get triggered if we move it down though 
left. So you can hear it moving over there. Now, if we make this movement much slower, and you can see this little line that represents the actual movement that's happening. Now, if I take my release down, it'll come back, it'll just come back a lot faster. So that line, that little dot moving on that line will really show you what's going on. Now, if we do something a little more extreme, so you see that's not a movement I would do, but I'm just showing you, I'm just giving you a demonstration. So it's showing here. Yeah, and it seems to it stays there for as long as it's over. So. No, I believe it's coming back. It looks like it's coming back after it passes. So obviously I don't use this function all that much, but when I want movement, I, I'm usually not aiming for something super time specific like that. Uh, unless you're doing some sort of a gating or something, but then it's like really obvious if you're getting the results you want. But if we go over here to the LFO, now this is great. Oh, something else about this envelope. You see that it relies on a threshold to trigger the envelope. You can set that with a side chain. So you could set a kick so that every time the kick hits, it triggers this envelope turning on and off. I, I, now, the more I look at it and how it behaves, I think it is just a two-stage envelope. Uh, next up, we have our LFO. If you're curious about the side chain too, you have to have the VST3 version of it open. VST1 doesn't work. So you have to have the VST3. If I go into processing, you see VST 2.4. So I actually can't do it. The way you would do it though is you come in here and you have your input one. Well, there'd be another input option in the VST 3. Just It's just something that they did with VST 3. I don't know about the spec or whatever, but I recently changed where my, which ones they have. So now they're all VST 3. But when I was doing this, I only had the VST 1 available. So I can't actually sidechain in this particular instance, which is something that's kind of important. We'll look at sidechaining more when we get into the dynamics. Now let's come back over here to the modulation and select filter three again. You notice we could do this for each of these individually too. We could be like, oh, let's do this one. We could really create something that's got a lot of dynamic movement to it that just automatically responds on its own all inside of here without even using the distortion capabilities. But let's go over here to the LFO, right? Now the LFO, you can see it's moving back and forth on its own. It's derived from a rate, or in this case, the rate is controlled by a frequency. So we could go up really to, to 30 hertz, and that will sound more like distortion. Or we could go down to lower, maybe get like a vibrato or whatever. In this case, it's going to be a filter sweep, so it'll sound a little strange. Okay. Now you can sync this, though. So if you hit sync, you see, oh, do you want it to do it four times, eight times, or eight triplets? That's with the T. I believe four is quarter notes. Now we get over here, this is the fast range, so the 64th. This could be very useful for controlling like a bandpass filter on something that's going like wah, 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 maybe because a bandpass filter is a very common thing for that. Now you can also change the shape of the LFO. So right now it's a sine wave, but you can change it to like a square wave or a sawtooth wave, and that'll change like whether. Because right now it's going, you know, when the sine wave peaks, it's moving out. When it comes back down to its maximum uh, refraction, it's going to uh, come down. Rare fraction, whatever, however you say that. And then it's going to come back up and be down. And so the sawtooth is going to go up and it's going to go down and poof, it goes back up. So it's going to, it's going to, now I'm not sure. There's got to be some sort of a slope. It can't just teleport there. But uh, so let's just look at that one. Square. So it's more like teleporting between the two, but you hear there's definitely still a movement there. It's not like a perfect square wave. Sample and hold and noise. So those are your various options that you can use to control this thing. If you have any questions about this, let me know. It's pretty self-explanatory when you start messing with it and getting into it. The threshold thing in sidechain may be a new deal to you. If you do use the sidechain, you may consider filtering your signal before you send it in here because uh, you may only want a particular part of the frequency of that signal to trigger the threshold. But you can also see the threshold. You can see the signal right there. So you could fine tune it, but it may be easier just to filter it before you send it in. So the way you do that is you would like, let's say I want my kick to do it. I'd send my kick to my master channel, but then I'd also send it out to another channel that doesn't go to the master channel. And I'd filter it there and I'd send that signal into trash two to be interpreted by that. If you want to know what the VST3 version is supposed to look like. Let's just load it up on some random channel. FA trash and load it. 
and there it is. And okay, so here, this is the VST3. And if we go into the processing, see it's VST3. And there it is, our separate stereo aux in. So we can send signal in and have it be triggered. This little bummer, they don't have more than one. You can only send one signal in. It'd be cool to be able to send multiple signals in so they could sidechain from different sources. And it's ironic that FL can do that. The FL limiter can do that, but it like, for the FL limiter, you can only, it's only one band anyways. So it's sort of, a, they got the features in the wrong, in the wrong tools. Okay, so that's that. If you have any questions about this, let me know. I know I sort of, this is sort of a lot to take in, especially if you've never really messed with filters, but it's really pretty simple to be creative with them. Just understanding like the technical details of what you're doing can be kind of hard sometimes. Uh, subscribe and have a blessed day. Oh,